Well, good afternoon, everyone, and it's wonderful to be talking today and welcome to another Thursday lunchtime lecture from us all here at the Church Conservation Trust. Now, I know we call this every week Thursday lunchtime lecture, but it really is wonderful to be welcoming people from across the world. So a warm welcome to all of you um, from wherever you're joining from us from today. I see we've got people from across the Irish Sea and Ireland joining us today. So hello to you. And um, again, internationally, it's great to see people from America. Um, from St. Lucia and across the world. So thank you everyone for joining us today. It's wonderful to have you with us. Now, um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, um, especially warm welcome to you, do comment away and tell us if you're joining us for the first time. Um, but I'm just gonna quickly um, explain how these lectures work. Um, so if you have are joining us for the first time, hopefully this will make um, a bit of sense for you. And also when you join us for future lectures in the future, hopefully um, this will make joining a little bit easier for you. So first things first, our lectures are always completely free of charge to watch and enjoy. We don't put a paywall in place um, for you to access these lectures, um, but you can only watch them presently live on Facebook. We do record Record them all and again these recordings are made available on Facebook and on our YouTube channel and these recordings are free of charge. So the best way for you to get a direct notification from Facebook when we go live is to make sure that you both like and follow the Church's Conservation Trust's Facebook page. If you do that Facebook will send you a little notification whenever we go live um, so it's a really great free bit of um, free little tool that you can make use of there. We've created a step-by-step -step how to guide um, and there's a link in the video description for this or if you can't find it just send us a direct message and we'll be on hand to help. Now um, one of the ways that you can support us um, is by making sure you like these videos. And all of you now, um, if you've got a mobile phone, if you tap that share button, or if you're on a desktop or a laptop, why don't you just click the share button and share this with all your friends and family? Because um, it's always great to welcome people to these lectures. We'd love to welcome more. Um, but do throughout this lecture, please do comment away with any questions you've got for Francis, and we'll put those to him at the end of the talk. Now, as I said, if you'd like to um, support us, please do like, um, these lectures, do share them with your friends and family, um, but also please do consider making a donation to support us, and um, we care for currently 356 historic churches, and our Chief Executive Peter Rez will tell you a little bit more in a moment about the vital work that we do at the CCT. Now today we've actually launched a brand new membership page on our website, so joining us as a member is so much more easier now. So if you join us by direct debit um, from as little as £3.50 per month, you will get a copy of this for free of charge. This is Beautiful Churches by Matthew Byrne, and it's a fantastic book. It's got wonderful images um, of our churches that we share, saved over our 50 years of being in existence, as well as some wonderful stories and facts and figures. Um, as I said, if you join us by direct debit from just £3.50 a month, you will get a free copy of this book posted out to you. Um, the let code that you need to use um, is lecture in capitals but again there's details of how to do that in the link to this video alternatively you can send a donation by text um, you can text cct to 70331 to give us a gift of three pounds or you can donate on our website now um, that's everything from me in terms of technical um, aspects but if you've got any questions um, please do um, send us a direct message um, or comment away and we'll be on hand to help. But I'm gonna pass you over to our Chief Executive, Peter Rez now, who's gonna tell you a bit more about our work at the Church Conservation Trust. Thanks, George. And uh, very lovely to see you all joining in again today. At the very worst, if you don't enjoy lectures these days, you get to see what the weather's like right across the UK and the world. I was very disappointed to hear that it's raining in St Lucia as well today. But welcome to the lecture. This has been a fantastic series for us and I hope you've enjoyed staying in touch with us during the time that we've been putting these on. We, we've enjoyed it immensely. Now uh, it's been a very difficult time for everybody across the world dealing with this and, and this charity is no exception really. Um, we've been in existence for about 50 years and we have a specific function to look after historic places of worship that are no longer needed for regular worship and we hold them on behalf of the nation in perpetuity and over 50 years we've collected 356 outstanding buildings we usually take on about two or three more every year 
Now, we're very concerned at the fact that COVID and how it's hit everybody and whether, in fact, this will lead to more churches uh, closing, unfortunately, particularly in rural areas. And we want to stand ready to support these buildings and the communities that love these buildings into the future. Now, we don't believe in holding them as monuments. They're not just things. These are buildings for people and always have been. And we have a re really great belief that these buildings are for everybody, regardless of where you come from, what your beliefs are and who you are. It doesn't matter. These buildings represent you and the place where you are. They have a profound relationship with the place where they are. And we want to keep them important in the landscape across this country so that everyone can access these uh, wonderful stories that are held in them. So please do support our work. We rely on people like you to not only provide um, support in terms of financial support, but we need you to get involved. As soon as these lockdowns are over, we need you to be out there going to visit these churches, go on, have a look and use them. Go to all the events that we've got lined up, which we've been frustrated that we haven't been able to deliver this year, but there's plenty going on and, and you can get involved and support these buildings with, with your money, with your time, uh, with your visiting. So please do that. And as George has already said, uh, you can sign up to join us. You get a free book if you get membership or from Direct Debit, but you can also make donations online to our work too. So please do stay in touch. And our supporters newsletter won't cost you a bean, uh, and it just means you'll stay in touch with everything we do. Now, that's enough from me, really, because you're here to listen to Dr. Francis Young. And I know you've had a uh, we've had a lecture from him already in this series and the several people had already said how excited they were to hear another one. Unfortunately, I missed that first one. So I'm really excited to be able to hear uh, uh, Francis today. So Francis is a, is a historian and a folklorist. He's authored 14 books and is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Um, his most relevant book, which I was going to credit entirely to him earlier on, but he corrected me, is um, as one he's published, republished, is, is his edition of Bogey Tales of East Anglia by Margaret James. And I'm sure he'll make clear how that relates to what he's going to talk to you today. But we're really grateful to Francis because not only is he doing these lectures for us, but he also uh, undertook some filming for us earlier this week in an undisclosed location doing an undisclosed thing that you'll have to wait and see later on in this month to see what happens. So with that tantalizing uh, teaser of what's to come in the future, uh, let me hand you over to Francis and thank you Francis for doing this lecture for us. Thank you very much. And I'm just going to share my screen so that you can see the PowerPoint slides that accompany this talk. And there we are. So the title of this talk is Christmas Ghosts. And I think that anyone with even a passing interest in the literary form of the ghost story We'll know that Montague Rhodes James, M.R. James, widely acknowledged as the greatest master of the ghost story who's ever lived, used to read a ghost story yearly at Christmas time at King's College, Cambridge, to a select gathering of students and fellows. James later wrote up finished versions of those stories for his volumes of collected ghost stories. But I think it's important to remember that by the late 19th century, when James began these readings, the Christmas ghost story was already something of a literary cliche. Charles Dickens's A Christmas Carol, which appeared in 1843, was, depending on your view, either the summit of this tradition or a complete subversion of it. Because A Christmas Carol, although there's plenty of ghosts in it, is clearly not really about the ghosts themselves. It's a morality tale in which those ghosts play a number of functions. Oddly, in spite of the popularity of A Christmas Carol and its multiple TV and film adaptations though, many people today are still unaware that Christmas was once associated more than any other season with the telling of ghost stories. There's a widespread belief that Halloween is actually the best season for telling ghost stories, but really before the 20th century, we rarely come across the idea that ghost stories are associated with Halloween. It's very much tr Christmas traditionally that is the spookiest time of year. 
Now, when I say Christmas, I don't, of course, mean Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, but Christmas in its traditional sense, the season of Christmas, running from sundown on the evening of the 24th of December through to Twelfth Night, Twelfth Night being the 5th of January, the evening preceding the Feast of the Epiphany on the 6th of January. This was the period when in the Middle Ages and after, festivities continued for 12 days around the huge smoldering Yule log, which was supposed to be large enough to smoke and burn throughout the whole season. The medieval Christmas was the ultimate stand of light against dark of warmth against cold and darkness in the depths of Europe's little ice age. Small wonder then that this strange time of year gave rise to cathartic tales of the dark, death and the macabre. Because the desire to be made pleasantly uncomfortable, as M.R. James put it, by tales of supernatural horrors when you yourself is in perfect safety, is as old, perhaps, as human storytelling itself. We can discern the origins of this strange combination of comfort and disquiet in old English literature. In a famous story recorded by Bede, the seventh century missionary, St. Paulinus, converted King Edwin of Northumbria to Christianity in this way. Paulinus asked Edwin to imagine human life like a sparrow flying into the King's Hall in midwinter. For a brief moment, the sparrow enjoys the light and warmth of the festivities before flying again into the freezing dark. So this life of man appears for a little while, but of what is to follow or what went before, we know nothing at all. If, therefore, this new doctrine tells us something more certain, it seems justly to deserve to be followed, as the missionary declared. In the same way, the action of much of the old English poem Beowulf takes place in winter when the warriors are hunkered down in the hall of Hierot, but at the mercy of the monster Grendel. Long was the season, 12 winters time, torture suffered the friend of the Shildings, every affliction, long against Hrothgar, Grendel struggled, his grudges he cherished, murderous malice, many a winter, strife unremitting. Now, Grendel isn't, of course, a ghost. Exactly what he is, is not altogether clear, but he is an otherworldly visitant. And the message of old English literature seems to be that the macabre forces of existential dread mass against the comfort of the hall in midwinter. This resonates with the Christmas message that we find in the gospel reading for Christmas night, John chapter one. The light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. But human nature is such that the darkness will always fascinate us as much as the light. Well, some have linked the appearance of ghosts on Christmas Eve to the holiness of the day to follow. On this interpretation, Christmas Eve, like the Eve of All Hallows, is a last chance for the forces of dark to come out and play before being driven away by the light. But I'm not sure I'm entirely convinced by this. In Christian tradition, the beginning of Christmas is sundown on Christmas Eve, not Christmas Day. And Christmas has long been associated with strange upheavals in nature. Most famously, animals are supposed to gain the power of speech at midnight on Christmas Eve, on the basis that the entirety of nature is transformed and in wonder at the birth of Christ. As the Gaudete Carol has it, Deus homo factus ast natura mirante, God is made man with all nature marveling at it. 
But this doesn't seem to be enough to explain why the dead should return at Christmas time. On a basic level, we all know that grief for our loved ones is heightened at Christmas time, simply because it's that time of year when families are reunited. Perhaps this has always been true of midwinter festivities. The dead are especially present because we miss their participation in our conviviality. In some countries, this is taken very literally. In Lithuania, whose folklore I also study, there's a custom that places are laid for deceased members of the family at the Christmas Eve meal, which in Lithuania is the major meal of the Christmas season, and the souls of the dead dying with the living. Similarly, in ancient Rome, people assumed the identities of their ancestors on the calends of January, that's the 1st of January, the day sacred to the god Janus, who looks both back and forward. And people took the masks, the wax masks of the ancestors off the walls of Roman houses and wore them in the festivities. The 1st of January was the beginning of the administrative new year in ancient Rome and the consuls took their offices. Although it should be noted that the 1st of January has only been the beginning of the year in England since 1752. Prior to that, the beginning of the year was the 25th of March. So it's rather a new thing in this country. The turning of the year is an immense outpouring of supernatural energy. A time for the anointing of kings, for new beginnings, for encounters with visitants from the other world, like the mysterious green knight encountered at Christmas, or Heliquim leading the souls of the dead on a wild ride through the night sky, which the terrified priest Walkelin saw on New Year's Eve in 1091. It's the presence of the winter solstice, the turning of the year from darkness to light, that is surely at the root of the association between Christmas and the dead. We know that the winter solstice was one of the most significant times of the year for the Neolithic and Bronze Age builders of many megalithic monuments. Why that was is something we can only speculate about. But in the Middle Ages, many people believed that there was a chance for the souls of the dead to return from purgatory at the turning of the year in order to ask for prayers in the coming year. The old idea that a new year began at the winter solstice is hinted at in the medieval English poem, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, where Gawain must go in search of the Green Knight a year and a half after beheading the mysterious giant at the Christmas feast at King Arthur's court. Besides Dickens's A Christmas Carol, the most famous Christmas ghost story is surely one that never gets told the sad tale of sprites and goblins, started but left unfinished by the boy Mamilius in Shakespeare's A Winter's Tale. There was a man dwelt by a churchyard. In his short story of the same title, M.R. James sought to complete Mamilius's story. But in those eight words, there was a man dwelt by a churchyard, we have the essence of the medieval and early modern midwinter ghost story. The setting is the churchyard, not because of the modern idea that churchyards are spooky, but because the churchyard is the resting place of the dead. Mamilius's story is not first and foremost a frightening one, but as the boy says, a sad one. For the souls of the living returned at the turning of the year to demand the mercy of the living through the offering of prayers and masses. They didn't return just to scare people. The Christmas ghost story cathartically exorcises our fear of the spirits of the outer darkness, like Grendel. But it's also, I would suggest, a mechanism for managing our collective grief at the loss of the departed and a reminder to offer them their due. 
In this context, the morally insistent ghosts of A Christmas Carol are perhaps not as untraditional as they might first appear. If the tradition of telling Christmas ghost stories is as old as time itself, the tradition of publishing them is rather more recent, dating back to a story published by Washington Irving in 1820. It was Charles Dickens, however, who made the printed Christmas ghost story a tradition in his periodical Household Words. The popularity of ghost stories at Christmas time with publishers may have had something to do with their standalone character at a time when most periodicals would publish lengthy novels in serial form. Christmas editions of periodicals were marketed as souvenir editions, so ghost stories were perfect. The mass appeal of A Christmas Carol made the literary ghost story part of the canon of the Victorian Christmas that Dickens strove so hard to create, to the point of turning the Christmas ghost into a moralizing cliche. It was M.R. James who really breathed new life, or perhaps one should say new death, into the Christmas ghost story in the 20th century, introducing a genuine terror that would be transferred to TV screens in 1971 with the launch of the BBC's Ghost Story for Christmas. The films in this occasional series were generally, though not always, based on James's ghost stories. And the series was revived in 2005 and continues down to this day. Ghostly content at Christmas seems to be more powerful now than ever. The Christmas ghost story is far more than just a spooky bolt-on to the festive season, an antidote to tinsel and relentless good cheer. It's more than just a comfortable scare. The Christmas ghost story arises from the deepest roots of the midwinter season as a time of turning, of transformation and new beginnings. The winter solstice is a time of encounter with the dead when we are reminded of their presence alongside us at our revels. The tradition of the literary ghost story continues in what's perhaps a culturally sanitized form, an age old and complex negotiation between light and dark, between death and life, and becomes acute as the dark encroaches and daylight dwindles. Before I finish, I just wanted to mention a couple of books that you might be interested in. And I'm afraid I'm going to start very um, uh, uh, immodestly by talking about a book that I myself am responsible for. Uh, I am in fact myself a writer of ghost stories. So if you'd ever be interested in reading some of my ghost stories, my first ghost story collection was recently published and is called Yellow Glass and Other Ghost Stories. And as you might have guessed, they are very much ghost stories in the tradition of M.R. James. The other book that I'd really like to highlight is nothing to do with me, but it's a book that I feel very strongly needs to get published. And this is called Casting the Runes, The Letters of M.R. James. It's going to be a complete edition of the letters of M.R. James that have remained unpublished until now by Jane Mainly Piddock. And it's uh, currently uh, not quite funded. It requires a bit more funding. And I would really like, for purely selfish reasons, because I want to read this book, I would very much like to see it published, but I believe I'm not the only one who'd be interested in it. So perhaps that would be something to think about as something to contribute to in this festive season. But thank you very much for listening. And I'll look forward very much to receiving any questions that you may have. Great. Thank you so much for that, Francis. Um, I'm just going to um, stop screen share there. So as Francis said, everyone, um, we're now going into question time. So this is your opportunity to put any um, questions you have um, to Francis. So um, we've had a couple coming already, but um, before we go in, um, I thought we'd just sort of share with you a couple of um, facts that we recently found out about MR James, because um, we have a really interesting, interesting connection 
with him. So he was born at Goodnestone Parsonage. Now, Goodnestone is a church which is in our care at the CCT. Um, so it's really nice that actually the um, where he was born um, was sort of actually it's today it's in our care. So it's a really nice link um, to have um, with today's lecture. But as I said, we're going to jump straight into question time. So I'm just going to bring up some of the questions that have already come in. Um, I think it's quite a good one to kick off with Francis. But um, what is your favourite ghost story? Oh, my goodness. That's a, a hard one to answer. Um, my favourite ghost story by M.R. James is The Treasure of Abbot Thomas. Um, that's one which is one of his earliest. It was written in 1891, and it's about a, an overreaching antiquarian who discovers a clue in some stained glass in an English church, in fact, to the location of some treasure, which is located in a monastery in Germany. And so he goes in search of it. And I won't spoil the story for anyone who hasn't read it, but let's just say that he does find the treasure, but he gets a very nasty surprise along with it. And uh, it's one that I like partly because it, it does feature churches, it features a monastery, which are things that very much interest me. And I think captures James's own antiquarian interest that he was, interest, he was interested very much in churches and monasteries. So that, that would be my favorite one by M.R. James, but I have so many favorite ghost stories, it would be hard to say. I think that's a great um, starting point. And it was really good how you mentioned the letters that are going to be published. We've had a question that's come in um, asking where can people contribute to um, help get the book published? Yeah, the publisher is Unbounders. Um, so that's a, a crowdfunded publisher. So if you search for Casting the Runes Unbounders, then you will be able to find where to fund that. Brilliant. And um, everyone will um, find a link for that and we'll post it in the chat for you so you can um, see it. Um, if after this lecture is finished, if you scroll down the chat, you'll be able to find a direct link if you can't find it. Um, so you mentioned earlier, Francis, about Twelfth Night and how Christmas starts traditionally maybe um, at sundown or Christmas Eve and go right through. Um, someone's asked a question here. Why is there a dispute or confusion um, between Twelfth Night being on the 5th or the 6th of January? Um, some um, This lady said um, that her good friend has... Um, uh, the Twelfth Night Party on the 6th, not the 5th? Um, yes, I think it, it gets a bit confusing because, of course, we've got the, the, the song which is about the 12 days of Christmas. And it is, of course, true that uh, the 6th of January is the 12th day of Christmas. But the way that uh, the traditional calendar calculated things was as beginning on the evening before. So that's why Christmas traditionally begins on the 24th of December and not on the 25th. And it's the same with Twelfth Night. So it, it has traditionally been the 5th. Um, there's nothing wrong with having a party on the 6th, but the traditional uh, date of Twelfth Night would be the evening of the 5th of January, because that's part of the feast. Whereas the evening of the 6th is not technically the evening of anything, uh, because in fact, the major feast has already happened. So that's the reason why it's the 5th. And um, going into it, so uh, when we talked about, um, you mentioned earlier that the tradition of telling ghost stories was really, it was, it was Christmas originally. Um, it wasn't what we consider today, Halloween. Someone's asked a question here saying, um, is it a recent practice that the dead are more active at um, Samhain or Halloween rather than at Christmas? No, that's, that's perfectly ancient. Uh, the idea that All Hallows' Eve is one of those points in the year uh, when you might expect contact with the dead, that in itself is, is, is not an innovation. There are several points in the traditional calendar when you might find that the dead are believed to be active. Uh, one of them is St. Mark's Eve, the 24th of April. Um, in some countries, it's St. George's Day or St. George's Eve, the 23rd of April. And you've also got Midsummer, which is a time when the dead are believed to be active. In some countries, it's May Day. Um, and in some places it's Halloween. So it really varies according to what culture you're talking about, what country you're in, or even what part of the country you're in as to what's most significant. But Halloween, it's generally become focused on in recent years. However, the actual telling of ghost stories, that specific practice is very much associated with the 12 days of Christmas. And that's because you don't generally have a major family gathering around the 31st of October whereas you do have the family gathering. And I, I suppose what I'd compare it with is all the playing of board games that happens these days, um, which you know, I 
I, I always find a bit awful, but some people may love it, you know, where suddenly for the only time in the year, you're all together in one place and you all have to play board games. And it's this idea that there isn't anything else to do. You're all trapped together. What do you do to keep yourself entertained? And the telling of ghost stories arose from that very specific social situation, if you like. Thanks, Robert. So I think that's a really interesting answer you've given there. Um, is it, um, do you think that the modern church today still accepts the ghost story tradition or do you think that they um, try to distance themselves from it? Uh, yeah, there are some churches that really embrace it. Um, so I live very close to a, 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 a suburb of Peterborough called Stanground. And there was a, a ghost story writer who in fact was a contemporary with M.R. James, a friend of M.R. James, a chap called R.G. Swain. And he wrote the Stone Ground ghost tales uh, with a uh, set in a thinly disguised version of this village of Stanground. And recently Stanground Church has actually hosted uh, readings of those stories. So uh, that's an example of a, a church that has embraced that. And, you know, similarly, th there have been events around Great Livermere, the parish that James himself uh, was brought up in and where he received his inspiration. So I think those those churches that have a specific connection to the tradition are often quite open to the idea. Um, but yes, you'll find a range of, of, of views. I suppose my, my own view would be that it's about the contrast between the light and the dark. And I don't think it detracts from the spiritual significance of Christmas as a time of light, that we also make ourselves aware of these older traditions or aware of the darker side of Christmas. I think it only enhances the celebration. Thanks, Francis. And um, for, we, a couple of people have spotted that you've got a rather fantastic Christmas tree um, right behind you. And we've had a question come in here saying, um, not bringing greenery, especially ivy, into the house before the right day is said to bring dark forces into the house at Christmas. I never seem to know what day this is. Do you happen to know? Oh, there's a great deal of dispute about this. So certainly if you go onto social media, there are people with all sorts of different views about when it's allowed to put up your Christmas tree or bring greenery into your house. Um, yes, it's true that there are specific superstitions associated with ivy. Some people don't use ivy at Christmas at all because it's considered to be unlucky. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the, the earliest that you can get away with in folklore, putting up your Christmas decorations, would be the evening of the Saturday before the first Sunday of Advent. So in that case, this year, it would have been the 30th of November. Um, uh, sorry, it would be the, uh, the 28th of November because we had a slightly earlier start to Advent this year. Um, but some people say that it shouldn't be until sundown on the 24th of December. And yeah, opinions vary as to whether the greenery should be put up at this point or that point. Um, as far as I can gather, it was traditional to have greenery in the house from the beginning of Advent in most places, in Britain anyway. Um, but you didn't put up the major decorations. So you didn't put up, um, for example, a, a crib scene or something like that until the, uh, the, the evening of the 24th of December, but the greenery often went up earlier. Thanks Francis and um, we're going to go into some of the, the more the tradition about ghosts now because we've had a couple of questions coming I'm going to try and merge some of them. Um, you mentioned that ghosts years ago weren't meant to scare, um, they came back mainly um, seeking the prayers of the living. Um, when did they start to become scary? That's a very good question. Um, whether something is scary is of course in the eye of the beholder. Um, but I would say that the cultural significance of ghosts returning to haunt the living in, um, yeah, in the Middle Ages and in the early modern period is more a, a sign of God's providence. The stories present it as a warning to those who neglect their duties towards the dead. It's not so much there purely for the scares. The idea of a ghost story that exists in order to do uh, just scare you silly. Uh, to a medieval person that would have made no sense whatsoever and I think it probably wouldn't have made sense to anybody until the 18th century. It's very much part of the gothic literary tradition that begins with The Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole in 1764 and before then when you're telling a ghost story it's told as a true story. Uh, it's told as a narrative. This is what happened to a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend. It's not told as purely a literary creation. So um, yes, I suppose that ghosts start to be scary in the way that we would understand 
understand it as a result of the development of Gothic literature. That doesn't mean to say that ghosts weren't scary before then, but you never would, would have told a ghost story purely with the intention to scare somebody. That simply wouldn't have made sense, I would suggest. And looking at the um, supernatural experiences of Christmas and Halloween, um, and are you saying that the traditions, um, particularly around um, reading ghost stories over the 12 days, could it be um, uh, on any of those 12 days of Christmas or would it be on uh, more likely to be on a particular date? I'm not aware of any specific associations with particular days during that period. Um, sometimes it's more linked to Twelfth Night, but I think that that's simply because Twelfth Night traditionally is the culmination of the festivities. So the English tradition is that Christmas Eve, even Christmas Day, are not as big in terms of a big knees up as Twelfth Night, because Twelfth Night is what it's all building towards. And after that point, you go back to your normal humdrum life. So Twelfth Night probably has the strongest association of any period during that, uh, the, 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 those celebrations. But you've also got within that period other feasts, one of which is pretty gory and macabre in its own right, and that's the, the Feast of the Holy Innocents um, on the, the, the 29th of December. And that has a particular uh, association with the unquiet dead because the Holy Innocents really don't get any kind of revenge for the fact that they've been killed by King Herod. So that, to some extent, is associated with the supernatural and with the macabre. And there are certain particular traditions associated with the Feast of the Holy Innocents. And um, someone's asked a question here. So you mentioned earlier about St. Mark's Day and other feast days within the year. And someone's asked here about Easter. Um, and they've said here, wouldn't the rising of Christ after the crucifixion be considered a ghost story? I don't know if you want to comment on that one. Uh, yeah, well, there was a dispute within the early church about whether Jesus should be considered to be a ghost after his resurrection or whether Jesus truly returns from the dead. And there, there are hints in the story itself that the gospel writers were concerned that the resurrected Christ would be perceived as a ghost, which hence why uh, Jesus invites his disciples after his resurrection to physically touch him and touch his wounds to make sure that they are actually real. Um, and this was the, the Gnostic movement that said that, no, actually, Jesus came back purely as a spiritual being and didn't really rise from the dead as a physical body. The early church very firmly decided that Jesus really did rise from the dead as the same person that he died and in the same body. And therefore, the, the church's verdict on that from the very beginning has been that Jesus is very much not a ghost. Um, and yeah, th th that would not be seen really as in any way linked. Um, so yeah, it, 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 uh, except at a very early period when it was discussed, it's not generally been thought. Thanks Francis. And um, we've had a comment here that or qu a question um, and it's getting quite a few likes on the chat. So I, I'm gonna ask it, um, have you ever seen a ghost? No, <laughs> I'm afraid not. <laughs> my, my father did. Um, he saw a ghost uh, very close to where M.R. James uh, was brought up at a place called Fornham St. Genevieve. Um, my father was a, a teacher and he used to come home every evening riding a moped, uh, which uh, he wasn't very good at riding, but nevertheless, that was his form of transport. And one night he was coming back particularly late. And I, I remember it vividly because um, I remember how he looked when he came through the door. And I was there with my mum and my sister. I must have been about eight or nine years old. And he really did look genuinely terrified. He, he looked as though something very unusual had happened. And he said that he was on a very lonely road um, in that area of the, the Lark Valley near, near to where M.R. James was brought up, near to Great Livermere. And he simply saw something floating across the road um, above the ground, a sort of uh, shape that appeared faintly humanoid, although it wasn't possible for him to pick out any features. And it wasn't so much what he saw, but the sort of the feeling of supernatural awe that accompanied it. And he had no idea what it was, but there was no wind that would have moved it in that particular direction. It was just drifting across the, the road. And yeah, I don't know what happened, but I know that he really saw it because there's no way that he would have 
made something like that up or been able to appear as shaken as he did. But I suppose my attitude towards people seeing ghosts is that the experience is undoubtedly real. I, I don't have any doubt when somebody says to me, I saw a ghost. I don't have any doubt, assuming that they're not having me on, that this is something that they genuinely experience. But the key question for me, and I suppose for, for science, you know, which I can't answer, is whether that experience corresponds to something that we would consider to be conventionally real. Or is it another kind of reality? Is it a, a form of collective unconscious apparition? Is it a form of the brain tricking you? I don't know. I don't have those answers. I'm not a scientist. I look at these things more from a cultural point of view and a folkloric point of view. But it, I have no doubt that experiences that people have are experiences that they genuinely yeah, um, undergo. Thanks, Ron. And uh, you mentioned, obviously, Great Livermere, where near ML James grew up. Um, everyone, if you do go onto our website, which is visitchurch.org.uk, and um, use the map feature, um, around there, there are some fantastic churches, and we've got a few in our care around there. So if you're looking for something to do, if you're based in Suffolk and looking for something to do, do go church calling that area, because there's some fantastic, fantastic churches in that area. Um, we're still getting questions coming in. Um, so I'm going to go here, um, and slightly on the uh, sort of the religious beliefs here, because we've had a question come in which I think is quite interesting. Are ghosts souls of the dead in purgatory or limbo? In purgatory in medieval belief, limbo has a very specific meaning uh, in medieval theology. Um, limbo is something which is really created by theologians as a result of people asking questions about the souls of unbaptized babies. Um, you had high levels of infant mortality in the Middle Ages. Lots of people are losing their children before they can even be baptized. And when the church replied, oh, well, you know, your child is in hell, that clearly was not a very helpful message or one that was particularly believable. And so limbo is created really because purgatory doesn't save the, serve the same purpose as limbo. Purgatory serves the purpose of purifying a soul from the sins it's committed in life. And so that doesn't apply to unbaptized babies. So really limbo is just for the unbaptized babies um, and possibly also for the souls of very, very virtuous people who lived before the era of Christ. So some theologians would put Plato and Aristotle in limbo and say, oh, these, um, these people were very, very virtuous and almost attained to the truth, but not quite because they couldn't be Christians. Uh, so sometimes you get those in limbo, but no, it's very, when, it, when you're talking about ghosts in the middle ages, it's very much, the souls of the dead uh, coming back from purgatory, being allowed to return from purgatory in order to ask for prayers and masses because they have committed sins, but not enough help is being given to them by the living to expiate those sins and purify themselves so that they can ultimately get out of purgatory and get their ticket into heaven, as it were. Thanks, Rance. And um, We've talked a lot about, um, obviously, M.R. James, we mentioned about Dickens. Someone's asked here, um, what are your thoughts on E.F. Benson's stories? There's been some fantastic stories um, that Benson wrote. Um, yeah, they, they are um, some of my favourites. One of my favourite Benson stories is called Negotium Perambulans, and that's set in Cornwall, I think, and it features a, a, a bench end in a church, which contain, which features a, a picture of a horrible creature um, and of course by the end of the story it's turned out that actually that creature really is haunting the village and this is you know depicted by the woodcarver from life and it, it, it's similar really to um, the M.R. James story um, the one uh, about the, the, the cathedral where the, uh, the antiquary sees this medieval manuscript and it turns out that actually this horrible beast that's portrayed in the manuscript really is around. Um, it's a similar premise, but I, I like it. Um, the Benson story, because again, it's set in a church. And of course, Benson's father uh, was the Archbishop of Canterbury. So he had plenty of church connections. Um, and Sticking with authors, we've had someone ask a question saying, given what you said earlier, um, what are your thoughts on the books by Dan Brown? Uh, well, I don't know whether Dan Brown writes very much about ghosts, does he? Um, I, I must confess I've never actually read any of them, but um, it's, it's more, as, as far as I can gather, it's more um, sort of, yeah, fictionalised conspiracy theories about the church 
Um, so I don't, I don't, I haven't read them, so I don't really have much of a view. That, that's fair enough. And we're going to dive uh, uh, your comment there about what you mentioned about limbo has spurred on a couple of questions here. But um, are there any de descriptions of what souls actually did in limbo? Not really, no. Um, the, the closest that you get to it is in Dante's Inferno, um, which obviously doesn't have the status of official theology. It's purely a, a, a work of fiction, um, but is very much inspired by medieval theology. And Dante portrays the souls in limbo as actually having a, a, an okay time. They, you know, they're not strictly speaking in hell, they're not strictly speaking in purgatory, but it's a, a place of pleasant meadows. Um, it's, not a, it's not a place of punishment. But on the other hand, people in limbo, according to Dante, are deprived of the beatific vision. They're not able to experience the, 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 the vision of the blessed who, who get to see God face to face. So that's why it's definitely not the same as heaven. Uh, and um, you mentioned again earlier what, about your book, um, uh, about yellow glass um, ghost stories. Um, where can people get a copy of that? Well, you can search for it on the, the large uh, retailer named after the largest river in South America. Um, other, other options are, if you don't want to use that, uh, you can go to lulu.com, uh, which is uh, another place that it's available and just search for yellow glass um, or just go into put into Google yellow glass lulu.com, L-U-L-U. -L -U, um, and that means you don't have to use the, 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 the said large retailer. Um, but yeah, it is widely available online. Or indeed, in, in one bookshop in London, if you happen to be you're in central London, in Treadwell's Bookshop in Store Street in Bloomsbury, it's also on sale. Thanks, Rod. And if anyone does want to use that um, large online retailer named after a South American river, please do use a link that we'll post into the chat because um, at no extra cost to you, if you buy through that retailer, um, we get a free donation from them. So um, by so buying through them, actually, you can um, support our work at no extra cost to yourselves. Um, but you just need to use the link that we'll put into the chat. Um, I think we're coming to the end, Francis. Um, if you've got any other dying questions, anyone, please do um, put them in. Um, but um, someone's asked here, um, you talked obviously your, your, about your father's experience um, about ghosts. And um, what would you give as your definition to what a ghost is? That's a difficult question. I, uh, I'm genuinely on this question, um, genuinely agnostic. I, I, I don't know. Um, I'm open to the possibility that there are forms of perception of, of different levels of reality that we're not normally aware of. So it, it doesn't seem to me inherently implausible that ghosts exist. On the other hand, I do have a rather skeptical turn of mind. Um, I'm a historian, and so I tend to evaluate evidence quite strictly. And um, yeah, I, 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 don't have a, I don't have an answer to that question. Um, people in different cultures have had different views on what ghosts are. Some have put more emphasis on the idea of ghosts as being the souls of the dead. Some have put more emphasis on ghosts as being these visitors from an other world, almost like a, a parallel universe or something like that. But I think that the, the cultural factors are very important here. They determine the kind of ghosts that people are likely to experience. Which country you're in, what culture you're brought up in, that will have some effect on the way that you perceive ghosts. But I, I don't have an answer to that, um, I'm afraid. No, and uh, I think that's a, that's a fair enough description. And uh, as you said there, it's really important that we put it into cultural context, because obviously if we look at cultures across the world, every culture has their own version of ghost stories. Um, so yeah, thank you for that, Francis. Um, I think this is a really nice question to possibly finish on. Um, do you think M.R. James was influenced by Edgar Allan Poe? Yes, I think there is a certain amount of influence there. Um, I think that, you know, they both belong to a 19th century Gothic tradition in which Poe had really um, revitalized the tradition and made it genuinely unsettling and scary. Um, you know, very different from the kind of penny dreadful type of, you know, screaming skeleton stories that were popular in the, in the mid 19th century. And, and Poe really sort of moves away from that. And I think to that extent, James is a, a continuator of, of Poe's tradition of genuinely trying to achieve terror. Um, on the other hand, I think there are significant differences between uh, Poe 
and James. Um, Poe is, is almost, I suppose I'd see him as a, a, a predecessor of the horror movie genre uh, in that Poe is primarily concerned with provoking horror above all things. Whereas James, it's a, it's a bit more than that. And the, the antecedent that I would see for James and that many people have, have, have seen for him and that he himself confessed to being his major influence was a chap called Joseph Sheridan Lefanu. And, and if you like James's stories and you haven't read Lefanu, then I very strongly recommend that you do because he was a, an Irish writer living in the generation before James, but very, very similar stories in that they, they start in a, an innocent way. They, they're not particularly dramatic, but then something really quite shocking and awful happens. And that's different from Poe because Poe is melodramatic really from the start in many of his stories. Whereas in James, we're being dropped into this rather ordinary humdrum world of academia. And then something breaks in from the outer darkness, something really unsettling. Thanks Francis. I am gonna squeeze in um, two more quick questions because I think they're, they're worthwhile. Um, Firstly, um, what is the difference between a ghost and a phantom? Well, I suppose that one way of looking at that would be to say that a phantom is a, a sort of non-specific description of some kind of hallucinated figure. Um, so a phantom could be any kind of imagined or hallucinated vision, whereas a ghost is, generally has the meaning of something which is linked to the dead, something which is linked to a, an external apparition, perhaps linked to a haunting, linked to a place. Uh, whereas phantom doesn't necessarily have those connotations. And uh, uh, we are gonna finish with this question, but um, are your ghost stories that you've been writing, um, are they in the Gothic tradition or pre-Gothic? Um, so that is to say, are they scary or are they not that scary? And this is from someone who can't handle scary stories. They are in the tradition of the antiquarian ghost story. So uh, they are in, in that tradition started by M.R. James and continued by other people like A.N.L. Mumby. Um, I, I'm writing from my own perspective as somebody who's a, who's a historian who works a lot with ancient manuscripts and archives. And I often come across strange and unsettling things. And really the reason why I wrote a book of ghost stories was because sometimes there are things you encounter in your research as a historian that can't really go into print in the conventional way in a history book or an article. And it's that sense of unease that you get from being close to the past, being close to the dead for a lot of the time. That really is what motivated me to do this because like James, I suppose, I felt that I wasn't able to convey everything in, um, in, in my normal historical writing. So they're not meant to be scary. Um, that's not my intention. My intention is to, convey that sense of unease that sometimes, sometimes I encounter in my research. Thank you Francis and thank you everyone for those questions. As I said, um, as Francis said earlier, he's got um, a really fantastic book um, that you can get either online or um, as I said in a, a store in London, but um, we'll try and post some links for you for how you can get that. Now, before you go, um, we've got a couple of announcements. Um, if you haven't had enough of lectures today, there is another lecture taking place this evening at 7 p.m. The stream will start at 6.50 p.m., um, but the lecture won't start till seven. And that is with Dr. Emma Wells. She's coming back to give our annual lecture this year. Um, it's free of charge. And she's going to be talking on the subject of holy inappropriate, the secular uses of the medieval parish church. So do join us for that. That. Um, next week, however, we've also got two lectures taking place next week on Monday and on Thursday. On Monday, you can join us at 1 p.m. Um, and we are being joined by Peter Stanford, um, the journalist, broadcaster and um, writer, um, who's going to be talking to us about his newly published book, um, Angels, A History. Um, so do join us uh, um, for that on Monday and learn all about angels. Then on Thursday, um, we're going to be looking at Christmas folklore. Um, with Nick Page. Um, now he's just published this new book called Christmas Traditions, Truth and Total Baubles. Um, and he's that's what the subject of his um, talk is. So he's going to be trying to help us ditch the fake news about Christmas. Now, if you'd like to get a copy of this book, you can buy it through the CCT website and um, through our online store from Saturday. So do go onto our website and buy a copy of this book. Um, 
all proceeds from the sale of these books goes directly to helping us um, conserve and protect historic churches across England. Now, um, as I said at the start of this lecture, um, they are always free. Um, we've got lots more plans with books right until um, April now, um, and we'll be publishing um, the programme um, very shortly. But if you do enjoy these lectures, um, obviously do look at our previous recordings, share them, um, make sure you're liking them and do comment away because we do continuously check them for new comments and questions. Um, but please do consider making a donation to support our work. Um, as I said, you can text, um, you can text CCT to 70331 to give us a gift of three pounds, or you can join us as a member from just three pounds 50. Now, if you do that um, by direct debit, as I said at the start of the lecture, you will get a free copy of Beautiful Churches by Matthew Byrne. Um, but if you've got any questions, please do send us um, a direct message or drop us um, a comment and we'll get back to you. But thank you so much, Francis, for joining us today. That was really, really fantastic. And it's given us all a lot to think about and it's really set um, Christmas ghost okay. stories in their proper context. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And again, if this was your first time, do comment away and let us know. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed it, but hopefully we look forward to welcoming you back in the future. But as I said, hope forward to see, look forward to seeing some of you this evening at 7 p.m. for our next lecture or next week, uh, next week's um, lunchtime lectures. And um, thanks ever so much, everyone. And um, take care.